Thank you. All right, uh, thanks all. I'm afraid that I am going to follow that very real and lovely um, start with a talk that is mostly about language and theory and abstract discourse and why we might prefer certain concepts over others or how certain concepts can be, let's say, misused, whether intentionally or strategically in the pol political sphere and the regulatory sphere and how this affects our dynamics with some of these organizations. So in particular, I'm going to talk about information flow control and privacy. Um, I want to note that the material in this talk comes from a variety of sources. I'd particularly like to thank Patrick, a priori, Isaac, and other folks in and outside the Enoma team. This presentation is not about Enoma, but Enoma is a project that I work on. So I want to cover basically three points in this talk. The first point is what is privacy? We talk about privacy a lot, and we use it in this kind of, I would, I would argue, a little bit vague sort of way. So I want to drill down towards what we actually mean, and in particular, what we could mean by that word in the context of, let's say, blockchain systems or even just digital distributed databases, uh, in contrast to what we might mean by that word in everyday discourse. And I think those two meanings are a little bit different, and investigating how they are different is informative. Um, the second part of this talk will be about a field of research called information flow control, which actually dates from the late 1970s, and which I think is very applicable and perhaps the kind of best or most, uh, just closest, field of academic uh, literature to a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve as we design these kinds of systems to keep users safe and to give them control over where their information goes. So I'll give a brief, you know, very, very criminally under-detailed overview of what that field is and a few of the papers and talk about how I think it applies to our problems. And then the third part of this talk will be trying to concretize it a little bit by talking about Anoma and Ethereum, kind of intents, and how information flow control, how this concept actually manifests in uh, some more practical examples, which I hope will help make it clear uh, what I'm talking about and why. So first, what is privacy? Now, I really, I, I actually kind of hate when people do this. They take a word and then they just look up the word in the dictionary and they copy the dictionary definition to their slide. So I'm breaking my own rule. But the reason that I'm doing it is that I think sometimes, especially in some of these more political contexts, we forget that when choosing words, especially when choosing words with which to explain our technology to the public, we really need to enter into a kind of mutual negotiation. If we just use a word and define it as something in like a math paper, that is not, you know, even if we use the word privacy, um, that is not the thing that people are necessarily going to understand. We can't just tell them to like read the math definitions in our paper. This doesn't work. We have to meet the discourse where it's at, or at least meet it very close to where it's at. Um, and if we just, you know, naively kind of take a word in the language, particularly the English language, and define it to mean something different in a distinct case, but then use that word to try and communicate with the public, the understanding which they are going to have is much more based on the like existing structure of the language than it is what we specifically mean. So here I think it's useful to investigate what at least you know some not crypto-specific representative of English thinks privacy means. And Merriam-Webster defines privacy as the quality or state of being apart from company or observation, or uh, slash and the condition of being hidden or concealed. So. In particular, this is talking about kind of privacy as, you know, some sort of way that information is, some kind of place where information is hidden, or even some kind of act of concealing. And I think that this maps reasonably well to how we use the word privacy in the blockchain space so far. Uh, we talk about privacy chains, we talk about privacy coins, we talk about making your data private, like you have some data, it's over here, and then you move it somewhere else, and now it's private. Um, and all of these uses of language imply that we consider privacy to be something you get in a particular place, like there are private places and non-private places, or something you get by taking a particular action. And this is kind of my pet theory, but this uh, understanding of privacy applies quite well to a world of light. So in a world of light, where light is bouncing around everywhere, uh, you need to engage in some kind of act of concealing in order to hide something. Let's imagine you're in your apartment and you want to, I don't know, have a secret discussion or write up some really cool math formulae on a whiteboard that you don't want your competitor to copy with drones. This actually happens in Japan, apparently. but. Um, 
you might want to dry your curtains closed to prevent light from coming in, bouncing off what's going on inside, and reflecting outwards. So in this case, you need to take some kind of act to conceal data, right? It's kind of public by default, because there's light bouncing around and carrying the information. And you need to engage in some kind of active concealment, therefore granting privacy. So this, this concept makes sense in a world of light. Um, because this uh, keeping data pri private requires some active active blocking. But in the digital world of bits, keeping data private doesn't require an act. It simply requires an omission. The data lives on your computer unless you send it somewhere. It's not like, like you know, you don't need to make it private. It's already private. Um, the only thing you might do with some kind of network technology, I um, mean, basically everything we're talking about here is a, a, you know, one a particular form of network technology. The only thing you might do with network technology is send some of that data, i.e. reveal it to somebody else. So keeping data private in our context really refers to an omission rather than an act. And I think this uh, causes a lot of confusion. So one piece of confusion that it causes is that because people might think that privacy is about an active act of hiding, using privacy technology is seen as uh, perhaps much more suspicious than it actually would be if they understood what was going on. Because it seems like, oh, you're committing all this extra effort to like close your curtains and hide what's going on, but you might have your window open all the time. Why would you use privacy technology if you have nothing to hide? That's problem number one, sort of misunderstanding by the general populace. I think the word privacy is also misunderstood by protocol designers. You know, speaking as someone who dabbles in it, so I'm happy to critique them. Um, adding privacy, like privacy is something you can, you know, you have a protocol, you add some privacy, now it has more privacy. But in particular, taking privacy as something which is a property of technology. As in, there are like private chains and non-private chains and private coins and non-private coins. And I think this is a mistake. Like, it's not a coherent formulation of what could actually be happening at all. Because it's not protocol designers that choose whether information is revealed or not. It's users. So as a protocol designer, the only thing you're choosing is like what kind of actions your protocol supports. As I'll get into more later, you're not choosing to make it private or not make it private. You're not the one doing the hiding. And there's no hiding that can be done, only revealing. The third problem with privacy, and the one that I think is most serious in a socio-political context, is that it is misunderstood by regulators. So this particular screenshot is a screenshot from a bill called, in the great tradition of American imperial euphemisms, the Blockchain Integrity Act, um, which is currently in some kind of draft status in Congress. And I don't know exactly, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody here. I, I don't profess to know uh, where it is or what's going on, but uh, some lines in this bill, which was written by, you know, I, serious people who all else remaining the same, I'm going to assume have reasonably good intentions, um, and perhaps just don't understand what's going on. It includes this definition of privacy coin, and I'm going to read it to you. Privacy coin, the term privacy coin means a digital asset designed to hinder tracing through distributed ledgers or conceal or obfuscate the origin, destination, and counterparties of digital asset transactions. So, at least according to my understanding of things, this definition describes an impossible object, not an object that I'm saying should exist and the law is trying to ban, but an object that I assert cannot possibly exist because you cannot design technology to hide things. You're not the one making the decision. You'll notice that in both of these definitions, A and B, we have this kind of understanding of the concept of privacy as an act of hiding transmuted to this characterization of technology, right? A digital asset designed to hinder tracing, designed to make data private, a digital asset designed to conceal or designed to obfuscate, never mind the fact that digital assets and like database technologies are different and not correlated things. Uh, this is still describing something like uh, describing, you know, some hypothetical designer who has some hypothetical intention to make it difficult to trace data. But the designer of these systems, the whole point of decentralized systems and most of what we're building is that the designer doesn't have control. So this kind of misunderstanding of privacy, I think, is transmuted into uh, written text and draft laws such as these. And it really causes problems, not because necessarily anyone is like trying to do evil things, but just because we don't have an understanding of what's going on that actually maps correctly to what it is that the technology does. So uh, in kind of conclusion of this section, I would argue that as we use the word privacy, it's not real in our context. It doesn't exist. Um, privacy is not a property of a technology. You can't make techno technology that hides things. Uh, it's not a property of an action in the context of digital systems. The only choice we have is whether or not to reveal and what to reveal and to whom. And you know, insofar as we can talk about privacy, it's this like very specific property which is parameterized over both a specific event and, and an observer. You know, I have a transaction. 
I send it, maybe I send it to Zcash, and I reveal it to you know A, but not B. So that transaction is private to B, but not A, right? Uh, we can talk about it, but it's really not applicable in the, the broad context that we're using it in. So what, it, what is it that these technologies can and cannot do? I would argue that they can uh, sort of force decisions of the user to be coupled or not. So in the case of a transparent system, like Ethereum, or at least the original Ethereum protocol, uh, the decisions about whether to reveal to, e to everyone and whether to reveal to like specific people are coupled. You send a transaction, and because the Ethereum ledger uses transparent validation, in order to send that transaction, you must just make it public. So you can either reveal it to everyone or you can reveal not at all. And a technology like Zcash, uh, which uses zero-knowledge proofs, simply decouples these choices. So it's still your choice who to reveal to. The technology does, just doesn't force you to reveal to everyone at once. You could choose to reveal to A and B and C, but not anybody else. You could choose to reveal to you know, all parties satisfying some other condition D uh, with sufficient cryptography, et cetera. So really, the only thing the technology can do is open up additional action space by decoupling these choices about who to reveal to. Um, and that's true, I would argue, in principle, not only as a matter of the current technology, but also as a matter of any hypothetical technology. The only thing technology can do is, like, if you use all the cryptography in the world, you can give the user maximally decoupled choices about what data they want to reveal and to whom, and if they only want to prove specific properties of data, they can use zero-knowledge proofs, and if they want certain threshold assumptions about what will get revealed, they can use MPC, et cetera, et cetera. So technology can give us precise languages for instructing other actors, you know, for both revealing data to other actors and instructing other actors what data we want them to reveal on our behalf. But technology cannot itself be private. It cannot like make user data private. It cannot do any of these things. So the thing that this bill is trying to ban is just something that like doesn't exist. So what do we actually want? I would argue that what we actually want is a way to reason about and constrain the flow of information around a system. We want to give the user the tools to see both what is going on as a result of their interactions, sending intents, sending transactions, and to kind of express their preferences as to how they would like that information to flow or not flow, and enforce as best as possible that those preferences are respected by the various network operators, solvers, validators, full nodes, et cetera, who are participating in the operation of these kind of distributed systems. So luckily, uh, the OG Public Goods DAO, also known as the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, was on this problem back in 1977, as tends to happen. Um, and DARPA funded a paper in 1977 um, called Information Transmission in Computational Systems. It's a great paper, really concise. I recommend it. Uh, that it doesn't quite use the word information flow control, but it's like information theoretic, information transmission control, it's the same thing. And this paper is the first to really reason about, and they're doing it in the kind of like more programming languages context, where they're trying to reason about the flow of information in a program. But this is the kickstart, you know, the kickstart of the research field, uh, where they're trying to reason about how information flows through some kind of computational execution, right? So information flow control started by DARPA, or well, by this researcher funded by DARPA, um, has been around <coughs> for a long time, and there are several as, uh, more recent attempts that are really quite like. I would argue pretty similar to our problem space. They're not exactly the same, but they're definitely a better place to start from than nothing. Um, one of these papers is called Rifle, an architectural framework for user-centric information flow security. Um, another recent one, which actually includes zero-knowledge proofs as an option, is sort of cryptographic backend. It's called Viaduct out of the Cornell Research Group. And these papers, although they don't, you know, directly apply to the sort of heterogeneous trust permissionless network blockchain context are very close and they have the right kind of mathematical language to reason about flows of information. So I think we can learn a lot from them. So now I want to talk a little bit about what this actually looks like in our context to do information flow control. And the project I work on, of course, Anoma use, has this concept of intents. And an intent is, uh, you might also know as a partial transaction, is a kind of declarative statement of user constraints and preferences. So my intent might say something like, I want to swap you know, five ETH for at least five USDC, and at least five USDC is a constraint, and maybe as much USDC as possible is a preference. And I use the example of a token swap only because it's simple, not because that's the only thing you should be doing with intents. Intents are not limited orders. But in the context of information flow control, intents are kind of like a boundary condition on the system. So I think it helps to draw it spatially, which I at least tried to do here. And spatially, we have all these blockchain networks, which you know of, like Ethereum, Cosmos, Solana. We have a bunch of solvers, other peer-to-peer -peer nodes. Um, and users are sending intents kind of from the outside. They're connecting to some RPC node, some peer-to-peer -peer node, and they're sending their intent in. 
So with information flow control, what users can do is reason about what information will get revealed to various parties in this network um, as a result of their sending it in you know, somewhere. And they can perhaps state in their intent some of those preferences and uh, you know, state them in a way such that other parties, such as solvers, can uh, respect them easily. At least in Nanova's context, we want to reason about three levels of information flow control, the state level, the intent level, and the network level. So let me describe these in turn. State-level information flow control constrains what can be seen by whom after a transaction is created and executed. Um, for example, shielded execution or something like Zcash um, only reveals that a valid transaction was submitted after execution, in contrast to transparent execution in something like Ethereum, uh, which reveals all transaction data to any observers. So that's kind of state-level information flow control. When people, when people talk about privacy in blockchain systems, so far, this is like almost exclusively what they mean, except for mixed nets, which, I'll, which we'll get into into network level. So then there's intent-level information flow control. Intent-level information flow control, in our definition, constrains the flow of information in the counterparty discovery layer. So what information can different solvers see and which solvers can see what? Um, this, you, um, sometimes MEV discourse touches upon this, but usually in the context of game theory more than like user privacy. <coughs> Finally, network level information flow control uh, constrains the flow of metadata sent around the network. For example, a user may want to hide certain physical network addresses. So this is uh, kind of like the declarative side of something like a mixnet. Like I would understand a mixnet as a particular mechanism for implementing or respecting a very kind of uh, defensive network level IFC properties. So at least I want to talk a little bit about in our context how this actually works. Anomi uses something called the resource machine. We've published a paper about this, uh, which I'd be happy to give you more details about afterwards, but just as a brief overview. And this can also be easily made compatible with Ethereum. We want to support that. Um, the resource machine is kind of like a, a combination or synthesis of the account model and the UTXO model. Um, so in the resource machine, the system state is split into these atomic units called resources. And each resource comes with what we call a resource logic, a program kind of like the smart contract equivalent which defines the conditions under which the, should say resource, not research, under which the resource can be consumed or created. And as zero knowledge proofs, or perhaps other kinds of proofs, but zero knowledge proofs are particularly interesting because they are privacy preserving, um, that these logics have been satisfied, can be created and verified independently. And this independent uh, proof creation and verification of different atomic components of state is what gives us this kind of fine-grained information flow control. So you can say something like, I'm fine with you know, the aggregate amount of my trade being revealed to a third party, but not the exact assets, or something like this, because you can split up the state into these different resources. So to go through an example topology here, um, I want to describe a specific topology, and then I'm going to describe two different information flow control policies and how those policies affect who can see what information through the course of execution. Um, so and in particular, I'm using a kind of topology here where Anoma is being used with Ethereum. Uh, there's an ETH research post that has more details about this um, if you want it, but I think you can also just look at the diagram. Um, so assuming that we have some intents and we have uh, some uh, kind of protocol adapters compatibility layer, so these intents can be settled on the Ethereum main chain, Optimism, or ZK Sync, and we have two solvers, which I'll call solver A and solver B. And let's start with just the simplest intent with kind of no constraints. So if I want to swap ETH for USDC, uh, I'm happy to get USDC on ZK Sync or Ethereum, but not Optimism. No shade to Optimism, just an example. Um, and I'm happy to reveal my information to anyone. So in this example, I've drawn the green arrows to indicate possible execution paths. So as a user, I send my intent in, then some counterparty intent comes from somewhere. And because I have not given any constraints on how information flow, how the information can flow, this intent can be settled along any of these green paths, right? Because those respect my constraints. Now, when I introduce some information flow restrictions or information flow constraints, in this case, that I want to reveal to solver B only, um, this then uh, kind of basically makes some of those paths uh, no longer possible because they don't respect my constraints. So here, the red paths are the ones that won't be taken. The green paths are the ones that are possible. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe I trust solver B, maybe solver B is my friend, I'm happy revealing my information to them, but I'm not happy revealing it to solver A, and I'm not happy revealing it to any of the settlement layers. So then the only possible paths of execution are ones where my intent goes to solver B. Solver B finds a counterparty intent that's capable of fully matching my intent. This fully matching part is important because it means that then the transaction can be fully shielded. And then that shielded transaction is submitted onto either Ethereum or ZK Sync, still either is possible because I'm happy to receive USDC on either ZK Sync or Ethereum. 
So I hope that gives kind of a, a, an intuition for what these information flow control policies actually look like in this kind of distributed context. If you think of a network with possible paths of execution, information flow control policies are like constraining which paths will actually be taken, and in virtue of that, constraining who in the network is going to learn what information. So to kind of go back just to the three takeaways, um, which I want to communicate with you today, and then I'll take some questions. One, uh, privacy is normal, uh, shout out to Zcash. But the word privacy, I would argue, is probably a mistake because it, uh, it tends to come with conceptual associations that don't apply accurately to the actual technology that we're building and comes with a lot of misunderstandings by users, uh, protocol designers, and regulators alike. And we don't have to use it. You know, A lot of people, a lot of groups that I really respect that have been trying to promote privacy technology for a long time have spent a lot of effort trying to like normalize privacy, to make privacy not scary again, to rebrand it, et cetera. And I greatly respect these efforts. And I must admit, I am not sure that they are strategically wise. Like, we want the technology to protect user data. We don't want to fight games about words. If giving up the word privacy allows us to better communicate what it is that the, the, the technology does, at least, uh, you know, from speaking for myself, that's something that I'm quite willing to do. Um, the only thing the technology can do is decouple choices of what to reveal. That is the only thing. It, like, doesn't sound very exciting. Uh, but probably in practice important, uh, technologies can decouple choices, give the user mo more freedom because they don't have to reveal to everyone or no one. They have more fine-grained control. Uh, and finally, the academic literature on information flow control, I would argue, is very close to what we need and probably want in the sort of just general Ethereum and OMA crypto-intense context and research space. Thank you very much. Hopefully I have time for questions. Yeah, here, Christopher. Last year I worked in NIM, who, here, here, here. Last year I worked in NIM, who also played the Cosmos ecosystem, and I would uh, ask you to reveal about sort of restraints that Anoma has, with, or Namada has, in that sense, being a part of one ecosystem, when then you want to coexist with others and expand it and work with, uh, collaborate with Zcash and maybe bring a privacy to Ethereum. Like how we, and how you approach those challenges being in one ecosystem, but generally solving many other ecosystems. Right. Um, so just to restate the question to check that I understand it, in general, the question is how do we approach being kind of in one ecosystem versus wanting to collaborate with everybody? Um, right. Um, I mean, to me, this like which ecosystem you are in question has maybe at one point it was primarily a technical question because there were very few interoperability protocols and most, you know, Bitcoin and altcoins were completely disconnected from each other apart from through centralized exchanges. I think over time this has turned into more and more of a social question. Like, you know, Namada and Anoma will connect to the Ethereum ecosystem and to the Cosmos ecosystem and we would consider ourselves you know, members of all of those ecosystems and very happy to collaborate with them, you know, in different specific ways. Um, I think now the kind of primary distinction is one of communications. Of course, different people know each other, different projects know each other, different communities know each other. And I think probably sometimes there's, you know, there's a sense of competition left over from uh, maybe older days of altcoins when that was more intense, when they're before interoperability protocols where it was more, you know, users were making a choice more of whether to use A or B, using both A and B wasn't really an option, but that's it. now it's generally an option. Um, and finally, I think that one thing that crypto protocols uh, would greatly benefit from doing that they typically don't do yet is collaboratively funding the public goods on which they depend. Um, I would w much rather see a kind of more application-focused ecosystem where applications, you know, collectively uh, fund the kind of protocol research uh, which they need. Uh, and I think that kind of like understanding of themselves as like consumers of many of the same public goods uh, and actual governance collaboration would bring more more of a sense of just like one ecosystem as opposed to many. Hey, Chris. Uh, great pants. You look great up there. Um, <laughs> So I only caught the second half of your presentation, but just so I understand the model of the IFC framing of the information system. So the idea is if you have a solver, for example, that implements the entire thing on a TE and therefore doesn't reveal the information that you give to it, that's sort of how you achieve the privacy rather than saying, okay, like I'm only going to send a subset of the information to this, to the solver. Yes. So if you, a particularly helpful paper, which I basically just like 
stole all this understanding from is Viaduct. And Viaduct has this sort of declarative language for information flow control policies, and then different specific cryptographic mechanisms which implement those policies subject to different trust assumptions. So in this case, a TEE implements, I mean, a very strong, like, complete isolation subject to the trusted hardware assumption. So that would be in the context of something like Anoma, you have your sort of declarative specification of the policies you want uh, to be enforced, and then the user can select, or you know, someone acting, helping them write their configuration can select which assumptions they're willing to uh, make, and then they can see like which settlement paths are valid given those policies and assumptions. Does that answer your question? Uh, why is it hosted on .dev? Why is it hosted on .dev? I don't quite follow, sorry. Your email address. Our email address, why is it hosted on .dev? Uh, just so that one day in 2024, I could get this random question about why our email address <laughs> is on .dev. Now it has circled back. Um, is there like a, a pure discovery thing? So like, let's say that there's multiple solvers that exist in the same trust zones. Can you like have like a discovery system for them? Um, where you say like, I want my policy to be routed to everyone that has the specific trust assumptions. Yeah. Yes. Um, for more details, see our paper. <laughs> uh, uh, no, 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 I, I just, I can give you, two, the two sentence explanation is um, yes, and we also want to, typically you also would want information flow control on this metadata, like which, what you gossip to whom. Um, so it becomes a very recursive problem and we haven't gotten all the way to characterizing that, but at least something like, you know, please make my information, which in tense I'm interested in receiving visible to peers who satisfy su such and such condition. Uh, that should be quite possible. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you.